Good evening. Good evening, everyone. So wonderful to have you here tonight. I'm Brian Furiso, the director of the museum, and this is a this is a special occasion for this museum on a number of levels, and you'll learn why uh, when Sarah and Micheline speak. But I also want to just reflect briefly. I was um, just doing a little research on Micheline, and I hadn't realized that she took art classes at my old museum where I used to work in Newark, New Jersey. And for those of you who know Newark, and the Newark Museum in particular, it's a very special place. And um, it really shaped my vision for what I think a museum should be. I know it influenced Micheline uh, of her taking art classes there. And so it's nice to have that level of connection with you, Micheline. So I, I, I enjoyed reading about that. Also, I think for us, having a very important artist at a very important time come to our city and our museum is special in its own right. And Micheline Thomas, who um, Sarah will introduce formally, is someone who is really shaping the visual world in which we live, but also reflecting uh, the world in which we live in a very thoughtful and critical way. And for us, it's uh, very important to have artists with us because ultimately our institution is uh, for artists, has been shaped by artists, and is really our future is based on artistic creation. Um, I think also this idea that her time and her formative years, Micheline's, uh, or I shouldn't say formative, I said some of her years have were spent in Portland and at this museum means a lot to us. To have her back, to have her speak at this museum um, where she was a visitor and an audience and a member of this community is very, very special. Um, also, I'd like to just thank and recognize Beresford Booth. And Beresford was the curator of Constructing Identity. And I don't know if Beresford's here. I think he's coming. Is Beresford here? Uh, he's not here. If he was, he would raise his hand and say hello. But um, he will be here, I'm sure, over the weekend. But Beresford has been a very special person to us. He is the curator of the Petrucci Family Collection based in New Jersey. And in, in, um, he's also a professor at Lehigh University who came out with Jim Petrucci, my friend, and helped us shape constructing identity, uh, major works of African-American art from the Petrucci family collection, which we have had on view and welcomed over 60,000 visitors. And it's still up to this day and has been incredibly impactful for our community. And in many ways, this talk uh, not only is uh, part of that, but again, shows Micheline's work in the family collection that we're showing today. So Beresford, thank you for sharing your expertise. Maybe you'll see this on uh, the internet or in some level of recording, but I, I wanted to thank you deeply from my heart because you have really helped uh, bring this museum forward in a meaningful way and connect more deeply with the program. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sarah Krajewski, uh, who is the uh, Robert and Mercedes Eichhold Curator of Modern Contemporary Art at the Portland Art Museum, an appointment she has held since June of 2015. And for those of you who don't know Sarah, uh, her tenure has been somewhat short, but it's been very productive. I want to give you just a brief background on where uh, she has had some of her past uh, curatorial experiences. And in between 2012 and 2015, she was the director of INOVA at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, which is an inter disciplinary contemporary art space, a wonderful uh, space, and I interacted and, and visited them a lot when I was um, head of curatorial at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Sarah was before that the uh, a curator at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle. So she knows a lot about uh, our community and the Pacific Northwest, and she uh, did a number of solo exhibitions on artists, but also group shows, uh, looking at uh, photography's impact on visual culture. She was also, a very prestigious recognition that Sarah received was the Curatorial Fellowship from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for Research into Emerging Transdisciplinary Artistic Practices, and has held curatorial positions at the Madison Art Center in Madison, Wisconsin, as well as Harvard Art Museums. And during her tenure here, the uh, exhibitions that she's organized, many of you will know these, and first on this list was the Andy Warhol exhibition of prints from the collections of Jordan Schnitzer and his family foundation. You may have also seen Steve McQueen's iconic drum wall, roll that she put together. Uh, she also did Josh Klein Freedom. What a powerful show that was with one of the most 
uh, progressive artist working today, Josh Klein, and then she also helped us put together Kenny Sharp, Cosmic Cavern. These are very memorable, memorable shows, and I think really reflect Sarah's impactful tenure here that's only been about two years. Uh, you may also have seen some of her acquisitions, Jessica Jackson Hutchins' Might, which is on view in the Jubit Center for Modern Contemporary Art, Vic Muniz's Rouen Cathedral, which was on view previously outside the auditorium, and Amalia Pica's Procession will be on view soon. These are all acquisitions overseen by Sarah. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Micheline Thomas and Sarah Krajewski to the stage for this evening's conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for that introduction. Yeah. And I do have a few words of introduction okay. uh, for our guest, Michaeline Thomas, yeah. before we jump into our conversation. Uh, New York-based artist Michaeline Thomas is best known for her elaborate paintings composed of rhinestones, acrylic, and enamel. Thomas introduces a complex vision of what it means to be a woman and expands common definitions of beauty. Or man. Just maybe of just a human being today. Uh, her her work stems from her long study of art history and the classical genres of portraiture, landscape, and still life, and we'll be touching on that as we get into our conversation. Inspired by various sources that range from the 19th century Hudson River School to Edouard Manet, Henri Matisse, and Romare Bearden, she continues to explore notions of beauty from a contemporary perspective infused with the more recent influences of popular culture and pop art. Uh, McLean's work has been exhibited at, at and collected by major institutions around the world over the last Except decade. Portland Art Museum. Except, well, we're working on that. <laughs> we're working on that. Well, we're going to pass the bucket, pass the hat afterwards. Um, and it's on view right now, however, in our, our um, excellent exhibition, Constructing Identity, the Petrucci Family Foundation Collection of African American Art. Uh, so. Uh, You've already uh, joined us in a round of applause, but please do join me in welcoming Micheline Thomas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the statement needs to be updated, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, well, we're really so pleased to host you here. Um, as Brian alluded to, um, you have a history here in Portland, had lived here Good for a number of years. Um, and during that time, um, you came to this museum to see an exhibition of Carrie Mae Weems' work. Yeah. And we've got an example of a work that's now in our collection that was on view in that um, survey show. Uh, and as you've noted in many interviews, mm -hmm. um, this experience was very transformative for you and led yeah. you to, to the path you're on now as an artist. And um, I think to get us started, it would be great to just hear about that history and what was it about uh, Weems's work that really spoke to you? That particular show that I saw, I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it was late 1994. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came with a friend, um, na native or Oregonian, who was a photographer. Um, and saw Carrie Mae Weems' work for the first time, um, had no idea who she was um, as an artist, as a contemporary. And I think for me, I had already begun up until that point going to Powell's bookstore. Um, and I started looking through books of like William H. Johnson and Ramir Bearden and Jacob Lawrence and wanting to like look at African American artists. But it was the first time seeing photographs and works by African American women in the museum. Mm -hmm. And so for me, being that I was away from home, which was New Jersey, um, and having very little contact with uh, people of color here at the time, 
um, it resonated deeply with me. Just uh, the familial, the gender, just the relationship of uh, family and the power of what image making was and can do um, and can recall something so, so real and familial for me at the time in art. Um, it just uh, resonated so deeply that I think for me um, it inspired me and whatever I was feeling at that time um, I just remember leaving the museum and having it just weigh very heavy on me and I, I did purchase some um, postcards and so I just had them in my room and then I remember coming back to the museum and I think I visited the museum during that time, during the run of that show, about five times. And just really thinking, and at that time I was in between studies at Portland State University. Um, I had just uh, decided that I didn't want to continue my studies. And I was hanging out with some other local artists and uh, just trying to figure it out. And I think it really allowed me to be rooted in that space and think that, okay, maybe I will become an artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I always like to tell people, you know, there's this, you know, when you think of like a Rothko painting, right? There's this um, analogy I like to, to, to use is that um, standing, whatever one is supposed to feel, when they're sit seated or standing in front of a Rothko, mm -hmm. whatever that physical, spiritual thing that's supposed to exude from his paintings or what he hoped to exude from his paintings, I think she achieved with me at that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I just knew at that time, it's like whatever that is, is what I would like to do as, as, a, as a, a career. Mm -hmm. And um, decided to make some really bad drawings, <laughs> <laughs> which you see here. <laughs> well, I thank you for allowing us to show this er early work of yours. Um, and um, which was um, a direct response to one of the postcards that I purchased from the museum um, that she has with the fairy in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, I was just looking and thinking about ways of executing it and just went to, can't remember the art store's name at the time, but just bought some oil pastels because it was much more readily for me and a material that I could understand. And um, some stacks of uh, Reeves paper and decided to uh, basically with books open in my apartment, um, I was living in Northwest 21st and Lovejoy at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the building's no longer there. I think they tore it down. Um, but uh, I just remember having my, my stacks of books open and just really trying to emulate how they made the image mm -hmm. and just responded mostly to the uh, looseness and somewhat naivete of how um, William H. Johnson made his images. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just felt comfortable, and it just felt right, and it felt like something I had to do. So I made a series of these and then mm -hmm. applied to art school with them. Mm -hmm. And I changed the date so I can get into art school. And <laughs> so it, like, I changed it forward or backwards? Uh, forward. Yeah. So I made them seem like they were present. Mm -hmm. I went actually, just to take it back a little, that same friend who took me to, um, who brought me to the, the show here, um, was so desperately wanting to go to art school and I didn't really know what that meant. And at that time, I had another friend who's a great artist here, Patrick Abbey, who had went to Skowhegan um, for a residency. And I just remember really not knowing what that was, but we were all very excited for him. Mm -hmm. We were all very like, oh, he's, He's going to this amazing residency. And he 
encouraged me. I had did these series of bad paintings, and I show. He encouraged me to show them at this really awful cafe um, um, in Northwest, and I did. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was really sort of. And he encouraged me to pursue it. Mm -hmm. And so I went to this portfolio day with another friend with these bad drawings and uh, met with some schools there mm -hmm. at a weird like center, city center where they had all these institutions there um, trying to convince people that they were making great work to come to their schools. Uh -huh. And so San Francisco Art Institute was one of the schools that um, I thought I was going to go to. Mm -hmm. But I ended up not going because Patrick had just come back from Skowhegan and told me about Pratt Institute. Okay. And, um, and thought, because I was saying to him how I wanted to go back to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, I know about this school, this school called Pratt Institute. You may like it. It's kind of in a bad neighborhood, though, but you should go check it out. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I did. And you did. Yeah. So yeah, I think that just, I'm just saying that to say that your journey and network is through your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they help guide you and give you the somewhat license to move forward sometimes. And you know, sort of those platforms. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Constructing Identity exhibition mm -hmm. is this sense of generations mm -hmm. and um, tracing affinities over decades. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe we could include that network of yeah. friends as some of the artists you were looking at. Like yeah, like Romare Bearden, Bearden and uh, uh, I'm curious um, if Faith Ringgold. Faith Jacob uh, especially Jacob Lawrence. I, I began to look more at Jacob Lawrence when I was, I think, an undergrad. And I think it was mainly because of some of the narrative and stories mm -hmm. that he told with his work, mm -hmm. um, the visual image. Um, and also just such a fantastic colorist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just the unapologetically, just with form. and. Um, just these hidden signifiers of like political mm -hmm. um, response to what was happening at the particular time, like the migration series we can all contest, just really fantastic. But I think Romare Bearden is the same way. And I think mm -hmm. for me, these particular artists, um, and I just think mostly as African Americans, as visual artists, we tend to tell our stories through the visual image we always have. Um, and we've never really had that, that, I think at a particular time, maybe in the late 60s, where we had sort of the agency and license to sort of not wear our visual image be so narrative or be about <laughs> ourselves mm -hmm. when you go into abstraction. Um, I think that sort of that has mainly been a, a white male's privilege, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's also the power of storytelling and mm -hmm. images. And so for me, I found um, much, much more sentiment to to be able to project my my ideas and and experiences through um, more representation. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a work of yours now, which I think resonates so wonderfully with that uh, interior. Of uh, Jacob back. Lawrence, oh, yeah. Jacob Lawrence. Yeah, I started doing interiors, I guess that was 2011. And I think mainly because at that particular time, up until that point, I was really working through a lot of some of the ideas around uh, beauty and the black body and portraiture and what those representations meant and how they impacted um, the viewers that I wanted to make my work for. But I also wanted to figure out how to create the same type of work without the viewer present. Mm -hmm. um, 
but still have it be about portraiture. Mm. So I started to look at these um, and collect these resources, um, found images from one particular encyclopedic edition, uh, the Practical Encyclopedia of uh, Good Home Improvement. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I had <laughs> got the entire edition from Amazon and I started to recontextualize uh, through collage what those images were like, sort of the artifice of those images, mm -hmm. and recreate these spaces. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of that. I think this was actually my first interior painting. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm surprised you used it, because <coughs> it's actually one that I, I, I actually decided to keep for myself. Oh. Which I think is important for artists to do. Yeah. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about interiors yeah. later. I've got some wonderful examples of installations. But um, when I look at works like the one on view upstairs, Landscape Majestic, I do think a lot of, of the collage tradition of Romer Bearden and mm -hmm. other uh, African-American artists. But there's, there are lots of layers within this piece. And um, first of all, it's a, it's a landscape a kind of tried and true genre, but maybe also a little bit of a time-worn genre. And I'm wondering what... Yeah, I think it was also thinking about like, what is a landscape? And I was mm -hmm. traveling a lot during that time. I think I had the fortune to, my art was taking me places that I didn't imagine I could go. And at this particular time, I was spending most of my time upstate for the summer. And so naturally being outdoors and the particular area I was in, I started thinking of the Hudson School mm -hmm. River Painters. Um, and then I still began to think about artifice and sort of how we construct our landscape um, and whose landscape is it <laughs> um, and how we occupy these spaces. And so I would take pictures from all of my travels and uh, create my own landscape. So a lot of the images that I would collect were not necessarily from one particular place. Um, they were from various experiences and places. Um, and then really looking and trying to question sort of the native land and how we sort of navigate these spaces and sort of colonize them. And, and take them and sort of create ownership over them. Um, and this was one of those sort of direct responses to constructing landscape mm -hmm. through uh, artif artifice and artificial images. Mm -hmm. Because I started realizing that some of them were a lot the same and I read this article at the time and I believe it was in the New York Times and it really tripped me out um, about Arizona and at the time in Arizona in the suburbs you had um, some of the residents being fined for not having their lawns green oh. and and I just thought that was really strange because Arizona as we know it is a desert mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> grass <Yeah. laughs> doesn't really grow there. So mm -hmm. the fact that they were putting these fake tarps out or spraying their lawns green was this sort of uh, false, false uh, reality of uh, suburban, which is Americana, mm -hmm. the white picket fence with green lawn. Mm -hmm. And so I just started thinking about fast forward to 20, 30 years, what does Arizona really look like? What is Arizona? Um, how do we really see these spaces once we create our own false reality, mm -hmm. which is how we perceive the world, the idea of beautification, the, the, how we would go through such lengths of endowment, not only with ourselves, but our environments. Mm -hmm. um, and that just uh, really tripped me out a little bit of how we continue to uh, create these false realities mm -hmm. and believe them. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to question landscapes. Mm -hmm. 
and how they're constructed and how we live yeah. um, and how we contain people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how landscapes entered into my practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was thinking of this piece earlier today as sort of an idea of a landscape or you know, mm -hmm. as you described, yeah. the construction mm -hmm. and uh, how it does seem today that we are um, uh, very much always constructing whatever whatever it is that we mm -hmm. want around us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, shift yeah, to and some people construct the president, and that's why we have them. Exactly. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> um, so, um, turning a little bit now to the portraits, which you're very well known for, um, your, for your portraiture, yeah. and um, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your process of collage within mm -hmm. uh, this genre, with, within portraiture, and um, a work like this one um, has this wonderful dynamic balance between an abstraction in the background mm -hmm. and then this representation kind of coming to the fore and there's uh, yeah. like wonderful tension With there. With fear, yeah. Um, well, I think of my, I mean, I've never really considered myself a figurative or a portrait painter, although I think of myself as an abstract expressionists that use representation. Um, not that it makes sense, but I, I <laughs> think it sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, um, only because I've studied mostly uh, and worked mostly through abstraction. Um, a lot of my earlier works were abstract um, color field paintings and all over kind of like crazy like Jackson Pollock and all of those guys. And um, I was really um, um, inspired at a particular time during undergrad with Aboriginal art. Mm -hmm. I did a residency um, exchange program when I was in undergrad in Australia and really became really in love with uh, artists like Emily Kingwari, who's an amazing Aboriginal artists. And so when I came back from that residency, for me, I began to just make crazy paintings, as one should when they're an undergrad. And um, so that need to have these sort of repetitive spaces or uh, planes Think, I think comes mostly from how I make an image abstractly. Mm -hmm. But then how do you put representation or representative images mm -hmm. and integrate that with these sort of abstract fields? Mm -hmm. So it made sense that collage was a way for me to um, work within sort of those modes. And using collage um, of my images photographically and also with different materials, it made sense to me to put them together um, and then use my collage as a resource for the paintings. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the process is through for photographic images and then through collage. And so it began to make sense to me how I could integrate representation, mm -hmm. like the portrait of my mother in this abstract field space, mm -hmm. the chaos behind. It's almost like with this, she's like, She's pushing sort of against sort of these planes. Mm -hmm. and, and I like the juxtaposition of those, um, those two genres together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this one's very powerful in that sense of the push and pull between mm -hmm. the background and the, and the, the represented, representation. And also trying to, you know, create uh, dynamic images of black women that own their space mm -hmm. and sort of claim these uh, spaces that what you didn't necessarily see in um, museums. Hint, hint. I'm going to keep saying that. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> we need to hear it. We need to act on it. <laughs> uh, so um, just going back to, to um, Carrie Mae Weems, mm -hmm. whose work you saw in the museum or um, other uh, African-American women artists like yep. uh, Lorna Simpson and um, that powerful example that mm -hmm. they present of picturing 
oneself or picturing uh, uh, black women. Yeah. And I think uh, it was uh, Carrie Mae Weems referred to it as uh, uh, making the invisible visible and, and bringing these uh, faces yeah. and, and bodies into, in her case, in the museum space or into, into yeah. the art world. And I think it's not necessarily, like I get what Carrie Mae Weems is saying, mm -hmm. but the fact that we're not, it's not necessarily for me making the invisible visible because we are visible. Um, it's just, you know, about, you know, the sense of validation mm -hmm. of, of, of being seen and making ourselves be noticed. Mm -hmm. um, because we've always occupied these spaces. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think for me that was one reason why I probably gravitated towards in Western history um, some of the French Impressionism because the French Impressionists using um, some of the women, as you will, in their, their images in the Odalesque and sort of women who were on the peripheral, right? Mm -hmm. And I just find fascinating that um, artists like Manet, Corbet, and all these um, male artists, Matisse, would use or paint some of the women in the peripheral, but then they were sort of ex removed from art history, right? But then you had the upper echelon, the class, upper class, who once those images became very popular and iconic, they wanted to basically emulate those images mm -hmm. through portraiture. And I thought that was fascinating, sort of, the black body was always there because they were Algerian women. So we were always sort of these sort of, sort of, it was like a double-edged sword and double conjurer. Just like in one way, um, we're on the peripheral, but then you, it's sort of how you sort of take, you know, ideas and concepts and then it flips it on its head where you have the mass, mm -hmm. um, sort of class who want to emulate it, but also don't want to give it its main respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the more I started to look into those histories and think about, especially a lot of some of the images that Matisse even made, mm -hmm. those beautiful etchings and drawings of the women, they don't speak about them being African-American women. And I didn't learn that till later. It's not in the history books, right? All of that information is removed or excluded. Mm -hmm. So what is the history we were really learning about some of these works mm -hmm. when you don't really even learn who the actual women are? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, and the fact that Matisse had a really amazing relationship with some of his models in, during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm you know, a lot of that is excluded from the history books. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we've been invisible, right. we just haven't been talked about. Exactly, yeah, well put. Um, your portraiture is often... Um, Sexy. In, in fact, in, in, I was gonna say around uh, discussions of beauty. Don't be shy, and look at her. Sexuality, and I love this, I love this image, uh, and desire, um, mm -hmm. and, um, I think you've just touched upon that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, but this image and the previous one, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the role of photography mm -hmm. in the way that you uh, work with your models uh, and uh, set up for the, for the portrait making. No? <laughs> um, no, no, it's good. Okay. Well, I use, I mean, Photography for me is um, a way to really capture and compose my images prior to my paintings. Mm -hmm. There, it's definitely a tool that I use in the same way that a draftsperson would use for architecture or someone who, like, if I think of someone like, um, you know, Eric Fischel who draws a lot mm -hmm. before, or he draws from, you know, nude models to get his compositions for his paintings. For me, I use photography in that sense. And for me, it's this very refreshing 
way of documenting my own history and sort of creating my own historical images um, for my own ownership of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think because in the past, when I was in graduate school, I used to work from found resources and using images from like Jet Magazine and Ebony and, and just realized that I didn't have the, the proper light source that I needed for my paintings, that it was the source that was given to me by someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really wanted to really recreate these spaces. And once I started photographing my mother and myself, I realized through these photographic spaces that I can really create these artificial moments that became really real, like a photo studio. Mm -hmm. And then looking at photographers like Malik Sidibe, African photographer Seydou Keita, mm -hmm. who really use photography as a way of journalistic documentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I wanted to, as a visual artist, as a painter, create these other resources for myself as you know, historical documentation. Mm -hmm. And so it began with just basically using like a 35 millimeter at one point, and then really expanding it to a photo studio. Like mm -hmm. what is that, mm -hmm. that space? And then I just remember at one point it was just a fabric backdrop. Mm -hmm. And then indeed, once the figure was in the space, the model was in a space, that I would look in a lens and realize. And I guess I realized at that time, while I was constructing the space and having the, the model reside in these you know, interior spaces, that there were elements that I would notice that were empty. So I would put like a plant or a lamp and then these spaces begin to become more installations that can be activated by the model. It became much more fun for me to have them walk into a space that felt real to them mm -hmm. um, and that they can relate to and that they can really, um, I guess, as you see her, undress, as you will, or not, mm -hmm. but to really allow them to own the space when they walked into the set. Yeah. So the image became Sorry. believable. I keep skipping ahead. Um, I, I like this sort of It's echo. because that okay. image makes you nervous. <laughs> <laughs> the echo of the, um, uh, am I blushing? Um, the, of your work in the, in the Yeah, you're studio. blushing. We should go back to that. <laughs> Um, See how the black body is so powerful. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I just wanted to um, jump ahead to some uh, more recent portraits <laughs> that um, incorporate a different element of photography into oh, it. Again, yeah. this kind of collage uh, element um, across the face here. Um, this is a really interesting image that's just kind of a I don't know what to call it, cubist, but like surrealist. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was thinking of uh, Duchamp's Descending the Stairs. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because uh, he talks about um, the fourth dimension and that fourth space that I didn't really understand. And I thought maybe this is what he's talking about, sort of like what is the fourth dimension in a two dimensional space? Mm -hmm. And to create that. Um, that, that sort of motion, mm -hmm. um, static motion in painting. Um, and for me, I, I think, I guess I can see it here. I'm so used to turning this way. I think also for me, the photographic images that you see, I began as my practice evolved and expanded, it became really important for me to try to integrate collage and photography because it was such a huge part of how I made my paintings. Mm -hmm. 
but it wasn't necessarily evident in the final execution in some of the earlier work. Mm -hmm. no, one would, no one would ever know that just looking at my paintings that photograph, photography, photographic images, or collage was supportive elements of how that painting was made. Mm -hmm. um, and so through different um, tools and techniques of silkscreen, I realized after doing a lot of printmaking that I could integrate some of my photographic elements without collaging them on. So none of that is, none of that is collage, it's all paint. The only other material on here that's not paint is the rhinestones. Mm -hmm. So that became a really fun thing for me mm -hmm. of really exploring painting and just questioning what is painting today, and mm -hmm. just trying to make sense of uh, sort of all of those notions, but also how do you integrate uh, photography and painting mm -hmm. into one image mm -hmm. without it being cheesy. Mm -hmm. Another image here with the eyes are comprised of a photographic representation. Um, when, can, is it important to you with your sitters to convey something of the individual? You describe them coming into the space and inhabiting yeah. it. Um, do, are you, do you want to convey um, Well, something? is it about them? Mm -hmm. No, it's not about them, it's about me. Mm -hmm. um, no, but mm -hmm. you know, um, that's not, it is about them in the beginning when I, for the photographic image, but once I, start the painting, it's no longer about them. Yeah. Um, they, for me, um, are a vehicle to allow me to use them as a way of expressing, of a stand-in for myself. Mm -hmm. um, if I could use myself, I would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think having them be who they are photographically, use, using the photographic image. And then once I go to a painting, it's, it's, it's really more about how to make it, how to transform the photographic image into a painting. Mm -hmm. And the image of the black woman, for me, is allowing her to, that's why I always had this fear to really abstract the, the black figure because I felt, felt like, um, there were so many other, I didn't want to obstruct or feel like there was this obstruction that I was thinking of with the black body. But once I began to use the photographic images in them, it made sense that um, the black body was also just a sort of this quiet moment and all of the chaos, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, she was. She has Mother Teresa. She has the goddess. She has uh, the queen. Um, and I like this particular piece, which I love about it is um, how she is like holding and pushing the weight of hers down, and like this, this, this chaos. Because I think you know, black women always this this notion of like wearing a lot on their shoulders, right? This, they're like the, the matriarchs of their family, at least in my family, like the women are the center, right? And they, they sort of do everything for everyone. And we, you know, it's like, for history, it's like from the mammy notion to where we are today, right? And so for me, it's wanting to have the black woman be so centrally poised and claiming that space and that everything around her, this obstruction of planes and everything is sort of all of the other shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, an image like this points to the odalisque, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, I have a number of images uh, of works that refer to these major white male painters, 19th century French painters, and earlier or 20th century American painters. Yeah, um, and then, you know, it's using them, but also um, 
reshaping how people see images, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this was like me adding a little of my queer sensibility into an image without hitting anyone on the head mm -hmm. with it. I thought it was a very appropriate way of to speak about um, love between two women mm -hmm. um, in a space. And I get very excited about the idea of when someone is doing a search just because, you know, with all the new in technologies we have, when you were, most people, they don't use libraries anymore, they use Google, right? Mm -hmm. And so if they were to Google, you know, a Corbet, then my name comes up. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, those kind of insertions for me are very important to al align my work with a particular group of histories that people could begin to understand, but also it's my, my silent way of um, changing how people respond mm -hmm. and think about images. So when mm -hmm. the Corbet comes up, this always comes up as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's a new dis discourse of conversation mm -hmm. of how we can begin to view and talk about art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the um, figures like the Odalisque, or here's an example of um, that form, the famous Ang painting, mm -hmm. um, the woman seen from the back. Um, are you, so um, as a challenge to us viewers and thinking and seeing images differently, um, may I ask if you're coming at that, you, uh, you mentioned a queer perspective, is it a feminist perspective, a political perspective, is it all of that, is it? I mean, I think just the act of me painting black women is always a political queer, it's, you know, it's a revolutionary act in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and putting those images out there. I think it's always a challenge of conversation when you put, when you try to rewrite some of the wrongs visually mm -hmm. and um, create new conversations. And I guess that's what excites me about work. I mean, not to go back on a Portland Museum, Portland Art Museum, but just as I was walking up into the contemporary galleries, it's the talk about the invisibility, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the first thing I see when I go on the third floor is like mostly male artists. Or, and if they are of men of color, people of color, it's always the African American men. And so how do we, how do we get into these spaces? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, how do we, and so for me is aligning my, my concept with works that have already been out there mm -hmm. is to be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's your updated version of that. Manet painting, Dejeuner Solar. Uh, and though and no, she's well, not a man yeah. on the right, but she can be, I mean, speak about intersectionality and transgender. I love the fact that a lot of people think that this woman is transgender. Um, and I, I love playing with, with those notions as well. And I, I mean, I have used transgendered women. Mm -hmm. And I don't always say who they are because I don't think it's important to. Um, the painted version of this, I believe, was shown at MoMA. Yeah, this this is uh, not the original one. This is a um, this one was actually commissioned for a collector. So this is this is the second one, mm -hmm. but the the first one I think is about twenty four feet long, mm -hmm. um, and it was commissioned initially by MoMA. I was invited to do which I think came before here, before the slides, the photograph, or after this. I was invited to do a project with um, MoMA for their modern window that they have at their restaurant. It was their wall series or something, their mural series. I was invited to, do, to participate by Klaus Biesenbach 
And initially, he wanted me to do something inside the museum, but I couldn't find a space for me inside the museum that made sense. Um, and it wasn't until we went into the sculpture garden and I saw um, the Matisse bronze reliefs in the back on the, on the wall, they were on loan for, at the museum, that it made sense to me just because of the relationship of uh, Matisse and Manet. And yes, that, that piece there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I knew exactly, it was the first site-specific piece I did photographically. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first commission piece that I had. Um, but I also was really excited about the fact that it was somewhat performative mm -hmm. and the sense where the space that I was occupying was also occupied by many other women who've done performances in, this, in the past. Um, and so that was very exciting to me to really um, open up other possibilities in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also what was very powerful was to have this image be up at the MoMA in the window for three years. And so, mm -hmm. you know, just that impact alone. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I feel as an artist is my responsibility um, with some of the opportunities is to allow uh, other women of African-American descent to see themselves, mm -hmm. to see themselves in the work that's out there and to see themselves in positive images. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons that I get excited about doing what I do. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask about the role of theater in your work too, because often these, the photographs that you make are quite so theatrical mm -hmm. and well, some portraits might involve sitters um, inhabiting the space, but others like this one seem very directed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess the, the performance is a huge part of my work and I think I like to think of it as with me and the women that I work with more of a collaboration mm -hmm. than me being someone who's like directing and saying, this is what I want from you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's allowing them to bring forth who they are in the, in the work um, and th seeing them transform with, you know, the makeup, the hair and all of this. I think it, anyone put in positions of such when you are perceived or your idea of dressing up and dormant you transform, we're always performing, you know? And I mean, and I think black people always work within sort of the notion of double consciousness anyway, which is a form of performativity, mm -hmm. right? And so we're always having to occupy these spaces and find ourselves in how we interact with people, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, she speaks art. She's so articulate, or something like. There's there's certain things that are constantly said to you, and you're always like, "We're performing now." Mm -hmm. So there's these notions of performance in my work that I love to bring forward um, when I create these tableaus. Mm -hmm. I become the director, but also allow my sitter so much more agency because I depend on what they bring forward to the work. Mm -hmm. um, more importantly, I want what they have um, and I want their prowess, I want prowess, I want their, whatever they exude in the world to come forward um, without me manipulating it. Mm -hmm. So there's very few times where I adjust the photographic image. Mm -hmm. um, I like to capture it the I what I bring for forward is the costumes and sort of the ideas, mm -hmm. and pick composition through art historical poses. Mm -hmm. But what I allow them to do is bring forward what they're feeling in the space and what they want to be perceived as through the image, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's very exciting for me. Yeah, um, I wanted. Um just to quickly touch upon the influence of pop art. Mm -hmm. And I think this work um, 
uh, speaks to me of Andy Warhol mm -hmm. and his uh, influence and how Warhol actually did complicate this gaze and this desire, uh, how images circulate and circulate so widely. Yeah. We see multiple images. Yeah, the multiplicity of yeah. an image and how it's used. This is not Lauren Hill, but it could be. Um, and this, it, is a, this is a very large piece. It's a large uh, piece. Um, and although it definitely, it definitely was inspired by um, Andy Warhol, I had seen a piece that he did. I believe it was of, might have been of Elizabeth Taylor or um, Jacqueline Onassis. I can't remember, but it, it was at the Byler in, um, in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And I had seen this portrait series that he did. And I, when I respond, as you mentioned, about Andy Warhol and other artists that work within pop cultural images is allowing those references to correspond as like that multiplicity of image that becomes so iconic that you believe it. It's just mm -hmm. like the media. If you hear things over and over, you begin to believe them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, it's important to, to, I created this range of, um, to me, it's like this is the double consciousness. Mm, also. <laughs> and the sense of how we're always having to navigate between these worlds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of our, you know, within our own selves and sort of uh, notions that are put on us of sort of identities of mm -hmm. um, socially and class and, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, being the only black person in a room and <laughs> all of these things. So like, what is your notions of beauty is through idolizing these notions through white women. And so for me, it was this sort of grayscale creating that of um, the blackest being sort of to, to, to being whitewashed and the invisibility of sort of like the invisible man. But I wanted to use a woman. So it's almost, it's not, it was taken, it was image taken from the internet, but what I did was compile it. I sort of composed it by layering um, several images um, onto one to create uh, sort of this iconic stamp, as you will. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not really anyone. It's a little of me. Mm -hmm. It's a little of whoever sees themselves in the image. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead a couple slides here. Okay. Um, um, I wanted to also focus on um, interiors uh, and um, the, we looked at a slide at the very beginning of, of, a, of an interior. Um, That's like my Hockney moment. Yeah. Hockney is like mixed with Hockney but, and Ramir yeah. Bearden. And, um, that was done when I was, that was based from a series of collages. I was a resident at uh, Monet's estate in Giverny, France. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that they encourage the artists during this residency is to be inspired by Monet. And I realized that most of the artists that I went, that went before me focused on um, his gardens. Mm -hmm. And I decided to focus on his, uh, his house, his, the interior of his house, because I was so, um, excited by the fact that when you walked into his house, he painted like every room was a different color um, in this interior space and how as an artist, what he did was construct his own still life, his own world to, to paint from, mm -hmm. of really having the, you know, creating a sort of environment for himself so he can always paint from. And that was the gardens as well, mm -hmm. creating his own garden so every day he can paint 
these lily pads and these flowers, but also what excited me about this house was that each room was painted a very specific color. So when you're standing in the room, each room was a different color, but also the flowers on the outside reflected that. Mm -hmm. And that how, as an artist, he created his own world to always have a resource of painting. And so that, that excited me as sort of a, a mode of working. And so documenting his space was important. I could see how that resonates with you yeah. because the, there's a very specific um, quality to the, and character to the interiors yeah. that you um, use for your yeah. sets and then you of late. So each of, yeah, each of these sets here, this was at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, each set was a representation of all four different models that I worked with. And so these sets were, in my studio, I actually built up these uh, sets in the corner. And so each set was what I created for each individual model. Um, and we basically just recreated uh, it at the Brooklyn Museum. What did, it, what did it mean for you to take that space that was an image it's like a tr translation from a spatial, from space to image back to space. Is there? Just anything? transcending and transforming that space. I guess for me, that's was really thinking about what is a portrait, right? Mm. And it's like remnants or sort of objects that could define or speak about a person. Um, through the object, you know, like your grandmother's shoes, like you get a sense of her, the essence of the person. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really necessarily need the models there, but I wanted the viewer to experience or get a sense of what the space was like that she inhabited mm -hmm. from through photographing her. Mm -hmm. Get a sense of that um, spaces once lived. Um, I always find it very exciting that there could be these other sort of things that respond or sort of uh, could define who you are, these sort of intangible objects. Um, thinking of someone like Kathy Opie who did the series with like, um, of uh, Elizabeth Taylor, you know, she did these great portraits of Elizabeth Taylor, just the inside of her house, but you get a sense of Elizabeth Taylor just by how uh, her mirror is, is sitting at her vanity. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a sense of the person by sort of the objects and materials that they reside themselves mm -hmm. within. Um, one person that we do get a good sense of, I, I think, through your work mm -hmm. is your mother, mm -hmm. who was, um, are they telling you to are, speed up? Yeah. You got the cue? Okay. So. <laughs> Don't be shy with me. Don't be shy. <laughs> you, know, you know all my tells. Um, so, um, uh, uh, your mother became a subject of a documentary film mm -hmm. that you made. Um, here's a portrait of her from 2009. It's a portrait of her. I started working with her um, during graduate school and uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. um, she was the first subject I sort of focused on. Um, and that was actually as a way of me and her uh, reestablishing our relationship. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, she began to, she became my first muse and it is a way of me, me understanding and looking at myself and sort of thinking about my own body, I just, it's mm -hmm. felt really important for me to start with her mm -hmm. um, first. Um, and so I worked with her up into uh, her death. And so the film was a portrait of her, which was very important for me to do mm -hmm. um, because she was dying and I had a lot of questions that I needed to answer. Mm -hmm. And so I created, I started to create these spaces that, you know, the portrait you see there of Michelle Obama, like I started, I created a, an installation with artifacts that were in my mother's house. Mm -hmm. And where the film, this theatrical space where you could sit and, and mm -hmm. 
somewhat of her living room, but also watch the film. So these were all of uh, the paintings and stuff that she had that she collected of mine that were in her home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seeing the piece, seeing the film in that setting was yeah. very powerful for me. Um, we have a clip, would you like to share yeah, that? Yeah, we can sh show the clip really quickly. It's, I, th I think this is a two minute mm -hmm. just intro. Every time we say goodbye I die a little Every time we say goodbye I wonder why a little Why the gods above me Who must be in the know Think so little of me They allow you to go When you're near there's such an air of spring about it There's no love song finer But how strange the change From major to minor Every time we say goodbye. Yeah. So. Um, that was a really exciting thing to do. And I think I decided to do this film of my mother because she was getting really, she was sick. Um, she was dying. And I remember being at her house and she said to me as I'm helping her put her makeup on and dress her because she had severe rheumatoid arthritis along with other illnesses. And um, I remember her saying to me, you don't want to paint me anymore because I'm not beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, you know, just, you know, because I, you know, speak about Lacan's theory all the time about sort of how you see yourselves, the mirror image and looking at, and I begin to question my own sort of self and agendas of why I wasn't using her, or why I stopped. And I told her, I didn't think you wanted me to paint you anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I suggested that if I could find a medium or a way or have some ideas that came to me to use you again, would you be open to it? And so I just started with a really cheap HD camera. When I would go visit her, I would videotape her. Mm -hmm. And realized during some of our photo shoots that um, how we rekindled our relationship was through this conversation we had when I would photograph her, but we never documented it. Mm. So I thought, why don't we just pretend that there's a photo shoot and let's just talk. Mm. I have questions. Mm. So I would ask her a series of different questions. And then I showed a friend, another Portland person, uh, who's a producer, uh, Tanya Sa Sa Severotnam, a good friend, these clips that I had and said that I wanted to make a film, but I didn't know how. Mm -hmm. um, and so she saw what I captured, this raw images that I had of my mom, and thought, 
she said, oh, this is fantastic, but I think you should use a better camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, she su suggested uh, if she could get a team of people who would be willing to help me do a film, would I be open to it? And so we did. Mm -hmm. We got a better camera. We got like a red camera that was really um, amazing and reshot um, with my mother's permission because she was getting, I didn't know how much time she had left. Yeah. And so we reshot uh, a lot of the footage with a better camera. And um, it was for my Brooklyn Museum show. It was only intended as an art film um, and as a way of resolve for myself. And I think as an artist, I, I use art as a sort of way of therapeutic uh, um, healing and um, and understanding. And so it made sense for me to make this film, but I never intended it to have it be um, any bigger than what it became. And so um, ironically at that time during the opening, someone from HBO was there mm -hmm. and they picked the film and that's why it went on to reach larger audience, audiences, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. So if, we didn't show all the, the entire clip here, but if some of you have the time, it's still accessible. Mm -hmm. um. uh, well, um, just to wrap up very yeah. quickly with the, the last few images um, that um, working with film seem to be a very pivotal moment for you, and you've yeah. gone on to do a couple of museum uh, exhibitions of late um, using moving image and installation. Yeah, I think after doing that film, um, it really uh, and it gave me, you know, the courage to really work in video and film as a, a new medium and way of uh, putting forth uh, images and storytelling in ways that are very limiting in two-dimensional images, mm -hmm. like a painting that I feel like um, through collage and editing, um, it allows me to um, have this greater access to um, pulling from images that are already out there, but also claiming them and using them as my own to tell these stories of black women mm -hmm. um, in a very powerful and visual way that I didn't have um, the access to um, before, and I think there's some things you just can't do in a painting, mm -hmm. nor should mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, video and film, I, and I think just through photography has allowed me to create these, these really dynamic and powerful experiences for the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, and think of my installations and tableaus as these uh, uh, contemplative spaces with books and literature written by African American women to recontextualize these spaces of how the viewer experience uh, my videos. Um, and this particular video you see is a two channel video of comedians and singers and it's all of the women singers that I grew up with and comedians that I, I, I grew up with and it's this really beautiful narrative uh, climax of them speaking about um, who they are as black women, their sexuality, their vulnerability, just how they're perceived in the world. And it's, uh, it's intense, it's chaotic, it's powerful, and then it's sad and just uh, true. Another very powerful element in the, in this exhibition at in Los Angeles, I thought, were the mirror, the silkscreen mirrors, mm -hmm. and you've mentioned the mirror a few times in yeah. the course of our conversation. And just thinking back to that very early piece with the mirror looking into the mirror mm -hmm. and Exa what's coming back. Yeah, at it you. became 360, and just thinking of how the theories that I think about and these ideas that I have in my head, how do you execute them? And so I began to f try to figure out how do you take a moving image and transform that into a two-dimensional image. And so it's like the reverse I was thinking, how do you make two-dimensional images more, you know, mm -hmm. filmic? And so 
I figured out a way through my you know, collage technique and silk screen of using and working on these mirror surfaces, the reflective surfaces, that through Polaroid double exposure, I can create these really um, crazy images when you're standing in front of you, you kind of see yourself. So mm -hmm. it's all these black women, iconic women, that's actually Naomi Sims, um, women who I grew up with as icons and using them to allow the viewer to see themselves mm -hmm. in the image. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Is this the last one? Mm -hmm. This is the last image. Would you be willing to take a couple of questions? Sure. Um, thank you for uh, attending this and gracing us with a really informative discussion. Um, I had a question regarding the collaborative nature of art. Um, I think it's fair to say that whenever an artist creates something, um, they're communicating with someone else. And um, we're bringing something to that conversation as are they. And um, I was curious as to who are you communicating with? Um, I see early on you're referencing a lot of black artists and I think about um, the exhibit upstairs where when I go through that exhibit, I see a lot of black art that is talking to black people because they're doing it without the lens or through a significant lens that is excluding a white narrative. And um, when I saw your work, I felt that and I was curious, did you have a specific person in mind when you were creating the art that you were making? Black women. That's my hope, black women. Um, communicating to all of those black women who uh, don't have, are, are, their voices aren't heard. So I, I think for me it's really about black women, black feminist thoughts, and just our own agency, you know? I think as an artist, um, and I also, and then it's not just black women. I think we have to remember that the diaspora is all of us, right? Sort of diasporic notions. It's all of us. So I'm communi communicating to those young girls who don't see themselves in the images that are in the media. So when they see my work, that they, they are inspired in the same way that I was when I walked into this museum to see Akari Mae Weems. Um, I think for me it's, it's foretold in that sense and it comes 360 in that way of how do you, how do you give your work that voice. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for coming and thanks for continuing to be an immutable voice um, for your beliefs and for promoting a powerful aesthetic no matter what we think. So thank you very much for that. Um, something occurred today after looking at your work uh, lots of times, but hearing you speak um, over the work, it made me wonder, your work is very much um, contemporary. It's very much, you're doing what every artist should do, is speak about your own time. But interestingly, and hopefully it's not a facile thing or incorrect to ask this, but your, your iconography, the, the potency of it is really arrested in the 70s. And I, I don't recall, because I haven't read everything on you and everything that you've said, which I'm sure will take a, a long time, but can you speak to the fact, is that because that was your formative years or did you yeah. really want to speak about how the black woman was left out of the 60s in many ways and then we sort of jumped to the 80s and there's a caricature and then, you know, where, how does yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I think you just, uh, I'm glad you re you've uh, noticed that, but it was, for me, um, recognizing that there's this huge gap <laughs> and uh, sort of images that we see in the world of black women. And I'm, I was born in the 70s, but so I'm more of a product of the 80s, right? And just through revolution itself in the 70s of all the powerful images of black women. I think it's 
sort of my political stamp <laughs> working from that place. Um, I was heavily influenced by images of black exploitation, and be it as you may, the pros and cons of those those particular films really had a huge impact on myself, like the Foxy Browns of, like these women were sexy and badass and taking, they were vigilantes, they were doing all these like really amazing things in courageous ways. And so, you know, with black power movement and also hair power movement during that time, there's so much that for the black woman was at the top of her throne that is not necessarily um, in images have been overlooked. And so for me to pull from there, I started pulling back from there when I was in graduate school because while I was in graduate school, it was so many stereotypical images or images of little Kim um, and these other images of like, as you would, coming through hip hop that I just thought those aren't representations of me. And if that is the persona of popular culture, how do we shift that when we see ourselves in media? Um, and because I felt like Little Kim was mostly at that time when I was in graduate school relating herself more to a fairer faucet than anything else because she was walking around with blonde wigs and blue eyes and doing all, but there was this sense of play with notions of beauty, um, the construct, right? And so for me, um, pulling from the 70s was this very, important signifier in my work. And that's where the Afro, that's why a lot of my earlier work, you'll see the, all the black women that I painted, I would put Afros on them. So it's this really subtle political jab <laughs> of uh, sexuality and sort of empowerment and prowess that I wanted my, my, the women that I was photographing and painting to put forward as badass. Um, I am wondering a little bit about as you recreate or reconstruct um, these like classic images, these classic poses, how do you go about or what is your thought process around <clears throat> deconstructing the male gaze in that? Um, I think that's a good question, deconstructing the male gaze. And I think for me doing that is allowing the sitter to have a real sense and power of her own gaze and who it's for. And as a, as, a, as a woman, giving them that agency. I think in doing that, I'm deconstructing the male gaze. Um, and I think we have to remember that we're all connected. So I'm not necessarily interested in demolishing it. I'm interested in bringing the new gaze forward. <laughs> And also, for me, I'm mostly interested, I, I think a lot of times in my work, there's a huge focus on like male versus female, but I'm more about the queer gaze, in a sense. So, um, it's a real line, it's like either male or female gaze. And so for me, it's, you know, I'm a woman who loves women, women, and that's where my gaze comes from. You know, um, call it my libido less, less the, whatever you want, but I think giving, there was a conversation that I had with, which I think is really important, so if you guys are able to get this, uh, my Aperture book um, called Muse, there's a conversation, an interview in there with me um, and Carrie Mae Weems. And in this conversation, we're talking about this. But what we came up with through that conversation is that we both love women in our own separate ways for different reasons. <laughs> and that's what's important. 
that women are beautiful. We talked about the way they walk, the way they look, the empowerment they have. And so for me, bringing that gaze forward is the most empowering. Empowering. Thank you. Thank you.